Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have performer, podcaster, and all-around content creator, Ivy LaBelle. Hi, Ivy. How are you? Hi, Holly. <laughs> I'm good. This is uh, this is the first time I've ever been on someone's podcast remotely. <laughs> yeah. It's a whole different experience. And I have to say, it's, um, we kind of talked about this a little bit before we started. It's not my favorite. I much prefer to do in-person podcasts, but under today's circumstances, we don't get to always, we don't always get what we want now, do we? We don't, no. Uh, if anything, we now know more than ever that we don't have control of anything. Just the illusion. <laughs> I know, right? It's kind of, uh, I, I don't want to like, I feel like we always end up talking about like COVID and quarantine in these shows. It's kind of impossible not to touch on the subject. And I don't want to get too deep into it because I know everybody's probably sick of hearing about it. But just in general, how has this whole experience changed like your view on the world and maybe yourself and your own priorities? So... My view on the world is definitely shifted because it's made me realize how individualistic Americans are and how incapable we seem to be to care for one another. Um, that's been really disappointing. But at the same time, as an individual, I've grown a lot in this quiet time. I've gone back to therapy and committed to going weekly. Um, I have been forced to work for myself literally without like an agent giving me bookings. So everything has been like, I'm responsible for me in every way. And so it's, it's been a good learning experience that I'm capable of handling shit all by myself and that I can actually thrive in a really kind of quiet environment. And it's been good for like the introspective uh, personal growth for me, actually. I think that it's really made a lot of us realize, I think, especially performers, how independent you actually can be and how we don't have to be so independent on big companies and brands. And I think that it's actually empowered a lot of, of people in a way that was unexpected. Absolutely. I was always um, really enamored with um, performers that I saw that only shot for themselves. I was like, how could you do that? That's so crazy. And then um, basically been forced to do it and, and realized that um, I'm very capable myself. However, I thrive like off of someone else's energy. So solos and like only working with myself and only doing like, you know, solos in my bedroom, solos in my living room, live shows, like it, it doesn't give me the same joy that I get out of performing with other people, which is why I got into the industry is I love having bags. <laughs> yeah. I was talking to a couple of different performers about that and they were just kind of like, you know, at some point there's only so many times I can masturbate in my bedroom and you know, there are some people that really don't want to go back to set and are very happy to stay home and shoot their own content and shoot on their own. And there are other people who really want to get back to set and want to work with other people again. So where do you fall into that spectrum? I feel like I'm right in the middle, actually. I um, deeply miss, um, well, I can't say I miss anymore because I did start recently shooting with other people again but for my own content um so but that's the part that I missed the most was working with other people and now that I've had a taste of that I do miss being on set a little bit um however I don't think I could go back to shooting for others as often as I was before um it was exhausting and I had no control over the kind of content I was putting out or my brand or my image. So I do like having that control, but I do also like to be on set. So I'm 
pretty much down the middle. I want to, I want to go back to shooting, but I don't want to, that to be my only primary source of income anymore. Right. And we were talking a little bit before the show about how you're actually going to be doing your first booking for browsers. I I think you said Mm -hmm. where you're going to be directed remotely and, you know, I work for Twisties, which is under the same umbrella. So I'm following as a director, the same protocol that whoever you're shooting with for browsers. So this is definitely going to be an interesting experiment. So what were you told about how the production's going to go? I was literally told that it's just going to be me and the talent who is Isaiah Maxwell, who I love. So I'm looking forward to that, but it's just me and him. And then Karen is directing remotely. I don't know about camera. I, I have no idea if there's going to be a script. I am so confused because, you know, browsers loves them a good script and a lot of key shots. So I don't know. Um, and maybe it's going to be more of like a sex tape looking video. I don't know, but it's anal and I have not done anal. Well, I can tell you from, <laughs> So I can tell you just from my perspective, from what I was told producing for Twisties and yes, same company, but again, Browsers is a different brand. So I don't know if they're doing things slightly differently, but essentially what I'm doing on my end is my, you know, we're renting out a location, one place for multiple days that only my crew goes into or my people because it's a crewless shoot essentially. So what happens is my assistant goes in in the morning sets up the lights in whatever room there's going to be leaves, whatever props that need to be used for that shoot, whatever wardrobe, if there's something specific that they want us to buy and uh, paperwork will be left there. And, um, and then the models come in hair and makeup ready, you know, maybe an hour later once the assistant is done has left and there will be in my case, at least I think just like, an iPhone set up on a tripod <laughs> because like, I was like, I'm not leaving my camera there because also too, I don't want to ha- leave something complicated for the models to try to figure out how to use. And I just, I won't leave my camera somewhere where I'm not, I, my lights are one thing, but my camera is another thing. And then they essentially come in and you know, like everybody knows how to operate an iPhone, right? So they just come in and they pretty much you know, take some pictures with like maybe one of those self timer apps that I'll have downloaded on the phone and then they'll hit record and shoot the video. And I will be there to like talk to them via FaceTime, maybe go through whatever the script is, which will obviously be something incredibly simple. Um, nothing like what we shot in the past and I'll be available for any questions. And, um, and then you guys just do your thing and then hit me up again when you're done and maybe send me a test clip or something like that. And then you guys leave. And then, um, like my, uh, Eva comes in, gets the content off the phone, um, you know, uh, leaves paperwork for the next day. And then we have like cleaners come in, clean the space. And then essentially the exact same thing happens the next day. Wow. So that's, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so that's pretty much how it's going to be for the beginning. Just, you know, they want to be really cautious and try to get back in production in the safest way possible. So um, it should be interesting to see how that goes. Yeah. I am particularly interested because my scene is anal, which not to, you know, I, hey, I love anal, but, um, when you're doing like sex tape style where there's just like one setup, it can be hard to get the satisfaction of the anal. Like you, cause I feel like the whole point of it is to really get those shots of the dick going in the ass. And, um, you know, I have a big butt. So I'm like, I hope that you can see the anal. I don't know. (laughs) We'll see. I've never done this. This I wonder maybe in that case, cause I don't know how Kieran's planning on, on doing it, you know, his method might be different than mine. Um, maybe he'll ask Isaiah to take the, the phone. I don't know. He may leave a camera. So I, I don't, I don't know. Um, 
and maybe do some like POV type stuff to ensure that you're able to see it. Uh, yeah, I'm interested to see how, how he manages that because, uh, I, I don't, I don't know. So mind geek isn't having a uh, cameraman or camera women or camera who, whomever's, uh, Beyonce. No. no, they don't want any crew at all. All right. Yeah. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how this kind of remote shooting goes, but I just know that, you know, we've been commissioning girls to shoot stuff at home. Like I know what you've probably been doing for your personal content platform. So I think even being able to bring back any kind of like sex scene is going to be just a plus for everyone. And I know that mind geek just wants to move slowly and try to be as safe as possible. So, um, so it should be interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's also probably scary when huge companies are doing it because it's such a liability. Uh, so I can see why it's going to kind of yeah. be, like, here's a camera in a room. Good luck. <laughs> for a little yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. And, um, you know, I, I think everybody knows that Pornhub's numbers are way up. So I don't think that the company is suffering overall. Right. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's crazy how the OnlyFans number is just skyrocketed. Like the second lockdown happened, I was like, oh, well, this has been the best time ever to be a sex worker. I mean. It, yeah. yeah, it's crazy. I mean, our industry, you know, has always been kind of famously recession proof. And just the advance of technology has really made so much more possible. Can you imagine trying to live through this quarantine without streaming services, without personal content platforms? Like if this had happened 10, 20 years ago, it would have been disastrous. Like people would have had no way to work from home at all. Absolutely not. And uh, you know, like the high risk that would come in if like you were a sex worker, like what else could you do? Like you'd have to take to the streets on, you know, that's obviously would be impossible right now. And it would be impossible to be very dangerous during a pandemic. Um, Yeah. So I feel really lucky. I remember when I, I was 18, I started stripping and everyone that's, I think that was around 2008 and everyone was like, Oh man, you should have been here 10 years ago. I'm like, well, I would have been eight years old. So I don't know. Cause like, <laughs> <laughs> apparently I started, you know, doing sex work right when we had that crazy recession before, but I, you know, I still yeah. was able to live off of it. Um, but apparently stripping was way more lucrative prior to 2008. However, if you're an online yeah. content creator right now, it seems like you're doing almost better than ever. If that's what, if that's your sole income, you know? Mm -hmm. So let's actually use the introduction of you talking about starting to strip at 18 mm -hmm. as a way to shift the conversation to how you actually got started and started important. Okay. Well, I, um, started stripping at 18. Uh, I've worked at every bikini bar in Los Angeles. Uh, my favorite being Jumbo's clown room. And, uh, that place is fucking, that place is epic. I've only been there once, but there was this like woman who would light herself on fire on the stage. It was, uh, yeah. It was really fun. It's really cool because it's all different types of women and there's just a jukebox. There's no DJ and they only keep like rock and roll in the jukebox. So it's like a rock and roll bar with hot girls dancing. And I loved working there. Um, I actually just got a jumbo tattoo. I got uh, a heart on my butt with 5153 in it because that's the address for jumbos. <laughs> oh my God. So, wow. So that's, you're really nostalgic about that place. It's kind of like a little like family energy there. I'm still really close with a lot of the dancers there. And, uh, 
it was my go-to like regular bar, like my cheers, even before lockdown, I would like, if I wanted a beer, I would go to Jumbo's. So I, I do love it. And a lot of the dancers there have a Jumbo's tattoo. So it just kind of felt necessary. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you started stripping, and um, what happened after that? Uh, so I, then I started doing makeup. I started working for MAC, and I really enjoyed that and ended up being a freelance makeup artist for about eight years. And that was a really cool experience because it took me all over the world. I got to travel as um, the personal makeup artist for a recording artist. And, uh, we, we literally went everywhere. I've been all over Europe, Australia, Southeast Asia. And so that was a really, really cool formative time in my life. And then eventually, I don't know, I'm, I'm a Gemini. So I feel like I always need to be challenged. I need a new adventure. And when I feel like I've conquered one thing, I have to move on to the next. And so I was 28 and I was just feeling really like, I don't know, just disenchanted with makeup. And I felt like my career was kind of at a plateau and there was nothing I could really do to elevate it. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to take a step back for a little bit um, and reassess. And so I went back to stripping because I've always known that to be <laughs> something I can go back to. And so I started dancing at Jumbos again. And uh, I'd always wanted to do porn since I was like 16. I would, I bought the Jenna Jameson book. I would practice porn poses in front of the mirror. Like who does that? At, like I was like a teenager doing this shit. And um, I had always thought about it, but I was always in a relationship or I was, there was always a reason uh, not to, and I couldn't find any other reasons not to. And I was like, I'm not getting any younger. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it now. And so I just decided to pull the trigger and shot my first scene in, um, I believe it was like D December 2016 and, and didn't come out until I think February 2017. So that's when I made my porn debut was in 2017. And who did you shoot for? Amateur Allure. Okay. And so, and how was, how was your first scene? So that's like a cute story in itself is that, um, I'm good friends with Jenna Valentine, who is a makeup artist for a lot of sets in porn. And she had me cover for her, um, for amateur allure. So I did makeup for amateur allure and I met Ray on set and he was listening to Skinny Puppy, which is a really obscure industrial band from the 80s that I love. And I was like, whoa, who are you? Like, who's like, what? And so we bonded and we ended up kind of being friends. And one night I was just kind of like half joking, like, if I ever decide to shoot porn, like, you're going to be my first scene. And then like a year later, I hit him up and was like, so about that first scene, are you down? And he, he was more nervous than me. It was really cute. Actually. I always think back of that fondly and think of how like he was more nervous, I think, because we'd been friends for like a couple of years prior. <laughs> I can see that. And sometimes it's, it's weird when you're friends with someone and then you, you know, they ask you to shoot you know, something a little more risque on them as opposed to it being a stranger, even though some might think it would be the opposite, you know, that you'd be more comfortable shooting somebody that you know. But sometimes when you take it out of like the friendship circle and you turn, you like put sex in there, it can be a little bit daunting. So I get that. No, I completely understand. So how, <laughs> how was your first scene? Like, who did you work with? How were you feeling going into it? What was your experience like? How did you feel afterwards? Well, so it, uh, amateur lore is POV. So I was having sex with Ray. So I think that's why he was so nervous. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. So, oh, okay. That, that, wow. That puts a, I thought he was just like shooting you with somebody else. That puts a totally different spin on it. Okay. Yeah. It makes a lot more sense why he would be nervous, but how did it go? It went, okay. So it was like, 
it was probably like the best experience someone could have for their first time, just in the sense that it was, it was chill. It was just me and him in his like shoot room with like a ring light and a camera. And so taking the photos was like a really good warm up. You know, it kind of is like takes your inhibitions down. You get used to being naked and you kind of go through the motions. And, um, I was obviously like pretty nervous. Um, but afterwards I just, I felt good. I didn't feel like my whole life changed. I didn't feel like a, a new awakening. I just felt like I would, I think I would do that. I would do that again. No, that, that felt right. It felt right. Um, I knew what a big step I was taking. And, you know, once you deliberately have sex for it to be on the internet, like that's that. Um, so I felt really confident in my decision and, uh, that my second scene ever was browsers. So it just like went from like zero to 60 really fast. Yeah. And you said also too, that, you know, once you decide to purposely shoot sex for the internet, you know, that's that. And you were older than some other, some girls that start in the adult industry by that time. I think you said you were 28, right? I was 29. Yeah. 29. Okay. So, you know, I've had a lot of discussions with, um, older performers and younger performers about getting into the industry at 18 and not fully realizing the consequences of what they're doing. Um, even though you started stripping at 18, which obviously like has sexuality and nudity attached to it, but it's not broadcast on the internet in a way that porn is. So do you feel like you made the right choice waiting until you were older to start doing porn or do you wish you had started younger and how do you think that you managed your career better starting at 29 versus like if you had decided to jump right into porn at 18? Well, I definitely think that 18 would have been a bad time for me to start. I just, I feel like I was such a kid still. And the cool thing about stripping was that you could still keep it anonymous and you could keep it to yourself, you know, like you, Mm. you know, even though I don't think there should be shame around sex work, it's still, it's, it's a choice that, you know, it's still controversial. And it, and it was way more when I was younger, you know, being a stripper came with so much uh, slut shaming. So I often wouldn't tell anyone that I, that I even did that. However, you know, I did start at 29. I think that, it would have been awesome if I started a little bit sooner, maybe like 25 or something, but not, not much. I'm, I'm happy with the way the timing has worked out for me. And it does require a really thick skin because it's hard. Like it's hard if you're not one of the ones that's immediately well received. And that was me. Like I'm tattooed. I'm not all natural. I was like, not a teen, not a MILF. And like these, all these things that were working against me that I never would have thought would work against me. Like in my waking living life, I'm like, I'm like in my twenties with like big ass titties and tattoos. Like this is amazing. And then I get into porn and they're like, no, we don't know what to do with you. And, um, <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> so I had, I felt like I had to do a little bit of proving myself as far as like just showing up and being a professional and, and being okay with not getting bookings from every single company straight away. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people think just because they're willing to do porn that they're going to be successful, but that's not the case. It requires commitment. It requires work, uh, consistency. And, you know, just because you decide to do it doesn't mean it's going to work out for you. So that's something you have to consider when you decide to do porn is that you might not become a, a full blown star and you have to be okay with that. Um, And I think that younger people don't always consider that. It's just like, well, I'm willing to have sex on camera, so I should be rewarded with all the accolades and money, right? You know? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. There's definitely that instant gratification culture that I think is especially prevalent in younger people. 
Um, we live in a world now where everything is instant gratification. You know, you can be on a reality TV show or um, American Idol and become famous super quickly. You can, you know, jump into porn and, you know, sometimes become famous super like some, you know, girls become famous really quickly. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, order Postmates and have your meal to your door in, you know, 30 minutes. So I think that, you know, as a, as a culture, we kind of expect things to happen right away. And, and I think you're right. I think a lot of people do come into the adult industry with this ill-conceived notion that they're going to be famous immediately. Mm -hmm. And that's just not the case. So you, you mentioned that you knew you had to prove your, prove yourself by being a professional. What exactly do you mean by that? Like to a new girl who wants to get into the industry, what would you tell them are some of the key things that they should do in order to be a professional and be somebody that producers want to hire and have back on set and work with again and again? I mean, you have to consider yourself a business and a brand. And um, for me, I think because I'd already worked for myself as a makeup artist and handled my own bookings for that, I um, I kind of had a little air of professionalism to, to myself. But I guess to me, being a professional is, um, you know, being responsive in a timely manner. Uh, when people are trying to book you or get in contact with you, uh, showing up on time, not making people wait around for you, being tested, um, you know, and ready to go and, you know, don't show up fucked up. Don't, you know, like it's just, it's really, really actually quite simple. It's just like show up on time, be prepared, like know what you're doing, know what you signed up for have a positive attitude, be courteous to the people on set with you. And I feel like that's basically it. And then from there, you can really express yourself in your scene, you know, and like, let your like, let yourself shine in the way that you want to. And for me, that's what I did. You know, it's like, I did the basics. But I think for me, like, my fan base was cultivated around the way I performed. And, um, the sincerity that I think I bring to scenes and like the enthusiasm. So really to, to be professional is quite simple, but I think it's all the other extra stuff in between that's going to get you further. And also having, um, you know, having a presence on the internet, which I actually struggle with. I'm not, I actually like really hate feeling like I have to like check in daily on the internet to the world. Um, I'm, kind of private. So I have to work on like posting consistently and keeping myself out there so people don't forget I exist because <laughs> they will in this instant <laughs> gratification world. <laughs> yeah, I feel you on that. I'm a big fan of scheduling posts and some platforms don't allow you to schedule certain types of things. Like obviously like the whole, I'm, I'm failing I ain't going to lie. I'm failing miserably at like the Snapchat thing. Cause like, I don't think to check in every day and like post a picture or a video. Um, so I totally, I totally feel you on that. That is, that is tough. Yeah. I tried doing fan centro and I just, I stopped. I was like, I would get so much anxiety if like my 24 hours lapsed and I had like nothing to show. And I was like, sitting around, you know, with no makeup on, like feeling bloated. And I'm like, what am I going to do? Like, I, this is so stressful. Like it was not, it was not for me. Like the Snapchat format was not for me, but so many other performers thrive, which is the beauty about, you know, being like an online, you know, sexual content creator is you can, there's a lot of avenues you can choose. You know, you can do the Pornhub route. You can do OnlyFans. You can do Fan Centro. Uh, you know, there's a lot of options now. Right. You mentioned earlier about uh, the enthusiasm that you bring to your scenes. So can you tell me a little bit about that? And I, I assume that, I mean, I've shot you, I shot you once in that, that movie for Joanna Angel, I believe. Mm -hmm. I think that's the only time we ever worked together. Yeah. And yeah, you were great. So tell us maybe about 
what is, what do you love about performing? Like, what is it about doing porn that um, you're so enthusiastic about? Well, it's a lot of things. I've, I've always been really, really sexual by my nature. Like literally that's the only way I can describe it is by nature. I've been told by other people that like, I just ex- exude this, this sexuality and I, and I didn't know where to put it for a long time. And, and it was, um, slightly satiating to shoot, uh, to do, um, like to do stripping and that kind of stuff. But I, I felt like I needed more. And when I started doing porn, it kind of opened up this Pandora's box for me and this kind of safe space to explore my sexuality. And um, I just get so excited. And uh, the the rush of being filmed as part of it, I do like that aspect. Um, and I'm usually working with people that are experienced and know what they're doing. And it's it's fun and I kind of get lost in it. And, you know, not every scene is, you know, going to be like that, but the, the, I usually can at least find like one thing about the person or the, or the storyline or something that gets me going. And I find that, that like spot within myself and I just hone in on it. And I just kind of like, uh, unleash my demons a little bit, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> it's like, it's really fun. I miss, I miss that part a lot. Yeah. Okay. We're going to take a quick commercial break. And when we're going to come back, we're going to talk about Ivy's podcast, Slut Shame This, and her views around slut shaming, female empowerment in the adult industry, and so much more. So stick around. We'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q&As where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. All right, so we're back. So Ivy, I know that you have a podcast called Slut Shame This, and slut shaming is something that's been like a big topic in our culture, I think lately. And there's been a lot of pushback against it. And, you know, I know that I personally really try to advocate for the idea of female sexual empowerment through porn. And I know that you're very like-minded in that way. So maybe tell us a little bit about your podcast and what kind of message that you're striving to put out there with it. So, um, In all honesty, I've taken a break from the podcast since the lockdown. And it's only because I've just, I didn't really know how to keep moving forward uh, with everything going on and not not be tone deaf. I, I just felt kind of stifled, but I will, I am going to pick it back up when it feels right again. But, um, I still stand by this podcast. I, it's, I'm really proud of it. And I encourage people to listen to it because it's essentially just a sex, love and relationship podcast where I chat with others, um, about everything from like anal 101 to knowing your own sexual boundaries to what it's like dating and in 2020 
And I, um, there's a lot of firsthand experience I can bring to the table of uh, being someone who's been a sex worker for most of her adult life. And also just having dated and been in relationships and been in therapy. And, um, I try to talk about things that are uncomfortable to talk about and, um, with a little bit of a sense of humor and just trying to normalize conversations that are, uh, you know, a little bit more uncomfortable to talk about, you know, like I always like get people hitting me up. Like I really want to try anal, but I'm terrified. Like, how do I do it? And it's like, you know, no one wants to talk about what you actually have to do to like get prepped for an anal scene. But I'm like, let's fucking talk about it. Cause like, it's like, let's, Let's just, you know, be honest, because I think honesty is probably the sexiest thing out there. And um, there's not enough of it. And the more honest we are with ourselves and others, then like the less there is to be shameful about. So hence the anti-shame. <laughs> yeah, actually, let's, uh, since you brought it up, let's talk, let's talk about anal, because that is a question that does come up a lot. Okay. Um, I know a lot of people are very curious about anal sex, but they're, they're afraid of it. So what is your advice as an anal sex professional? So my advice is I have a couple like key things. Um, one is don't be afraid of shitting on your partner. If you're going to have anal sex. <laughs> that is, Rule number one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's where, that's where shit comes out of. And if you're, if you're, if you're deeply afraid of shit, like just, I don't know, just maybe take it off the table, but there are ways to do it and have it be less messy or less likely. So I always like to do like a little clean out. Nothing too deep, just something shallow, just to just, you know, make sure everything is clean in there. And then as far as comfortable, I like to use a vibrator um, while like penetration first starts happening um, to help me relax. Because the thing that makes anal painful is um, us kind of resisting it because it feels unnatural where like vaginal penetration feels very natural. It's literally what we're meant to do where, um, anal penetration feels very foreign. So having a vibrator on my clit while that's happening helps me relax and open up. And then something that Joanna Angel taught me is that if you push out, it actually relaxes your sphincter. It feels very counterintuitive because you, again, are like scared. You don't want to like poop on somebody. But if you push out while they're pushing in, it re it relaxes your butt and you can like enjoy the anal more. And then after like a few minutes, it, it stretches out and it feels really good. <laughs> so you just have to like get to that point. Um, and if you're curious about it and you, and you know, obviously you don't want to like deep dive with a partner right away, I would say get like a little dilator kit at home and start with the smallest one and give yourself orgasms with your vibrator while you're stretching yourself out. And that way your um, body will have muscle memory of like pleasure associated with anal penetration. So I want to go back to what you said a little bit about clean out because you know, I want to remember that a lot of my listeners are not necessarily people who understand what that means. And I know that porn stars have a process to how they make sure that they're clean before they do a scene. And if anyone's like an expert on really, you know, being as hygienic as possible in a case like that, it would be sex workers. So can you explain how you, how you do that clean out? And do you have like a process before you do a sex and anal scene? Like, do you stop eating the day before? And are there only certain things that you'll eat? Like, how is your whole anal prep process like? So <clears throat> I think like um, anal prep for a movie versus anal prep for your real life are going to look totally different. Um, basically just anal anal prep for at home will be like a lot less <laughs> but usually i um i do my clean out the night before and i do and a clean out basically for me is just um lukewarm water and an enema and you basically just 
keep going until everything comes out clear. And the more you do it, the more you can tell when you're done. Like, you know, the first few times you're like, I don't know if I, I hope I got it all. Like at this point, I'm like, okay, it's finished. It's done. I got it. And then the next day I will do more of like a, I call it like a shallow clean out. So I just kind of like do shit out. I just kind of like squirt the water in, push it right out. And I'm usually good to go. If you put too much water up there too quickly before the scene, things can stay kind of wet up there, um, which can be problematic, obviously. So um, I like to like be done cleaning out at least like an hour or so before shooting. And then with eating, um, I don't, I don't starve myself, but I, I don't do leafy greens or anything with garlic and onion because that stuff upsets my stomach. <laughs> but that's basically it. So no salads before anal. I think that's like the rule that I've heard from so many girls. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. They're, they're just very fibrous. I don't know. It does something. But yeah, no salads. More like, I don't know, like chicken and brown rice. You know, something that's like bland think beige you know beige foods <laughs> yeah you know it's so funny i had and you mentioned earlier too about like joanna angel giving you some tips and anybody who knows anything knows that joanna angel is the queen of anal and she is the girl to go to for tips she's given me tips as well and ryan keely i had ryan keely on and she was talking about how, you know, when she would do anal scenes, normally she would like starve herself and it was really hard for her because by the time she shot the scene, she was so weak from hunger and had no energy. And that Joanna basically taught her about what Ryan calls anal pasta. And she was like, yeah, no, you can have like pasta and like carbs before your scene. You just, you know, like you just said, like no leafy greens and, and nothing with color in it. And Ryan said it just blew her mind and like changed her whole world. She was like, I can have pasta before an anal scene. Oh my God. It was like this revelation for her. It was so great. It's kind of like the best of both worlds. You get carbs and anal. I mean, what a treat. What a, what a devilish day. <laughs> Like, wow. The two is greatest indulgences in life is carbs and ale. <laughs> I, I, I completely agree with that statement. That is it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to um, kind of go back to what we originally um, kind of skirted around a little bit was like the slut shaming thing. So I always like to get the voice of like intelligent, well-spoken women like you who are empowered by working in porn to kind of contradict society's idea that porn is always degrading to women and that it victimizes women. So how do you respond to that kind of critique? Um, I mean, on a personal level, there's, there's so many arguments I can make and that my life has become so much more enriching since I started. It was an educated decision I made. Um, and no one is forcing women into this job. We are all here by choice, whether or not it's a good choice that is up for the the person on a very, very personal level, but that's the same way in any entertainment industry. You risk getting exploited in music, in you know, acting and modeling, and this is no different. You you can make calculated, really well, like really wise decisions and have it you know work out incredibly for you, or you can, you know, have some missteps and it isn't the best experience. But ultimately, sex work as a whole is extremely empowering to women because it, it takes, it, we've been objectified whether we like it or not since the dawn of time. And we're basically taking that objectification and using it to our benefit. And I don't think people like that for whatever reason, it does not sit well that um, we're kind of taking the power back. And it's like, God forbid, you know, we take something that's being, that's happening to us anyway and, and using it for profit and using it, you know? So, um, I don't know. I just think it, I think sex work is so special. Um, I don't know what the world would look like without it. I feel like you know, the people that hate on porn the most are probably people that watch it the most. And, um, 
I just feel like of all the people I've met in the industry, everyone is so of, like of sound mind. They have all made decisions to do this, like, you know, and it's all been very like positive. So I just, this whole concept that like a girl is being forced into it or sorry, not just a girl, anyone is being forced into it and, you know, or that, you know, you have to be on drugs or you're dumb. I mean, you know, this is just the only thing you're good at. That is, you actually, like, you have to be good at porn to be good at porn also. Like, it is a skill in itself. Um, with, like I said, with any business, you have to be business-minded to be successful. So I just think that it needs to be, like, looked at with more respect just as any other job. At the end of the day, it's a job. It's an impactful job. It's a life-changing job, but it is a job. Um, and yeah, that's kind of where I stand with that. <laughs> I, I totally agree with you on all of that. <laughs> all right. So I want to ask you, I want to close up with a question from one of my Patreon members. Uh, Mark Cunningham says, I am always impressed by and enjoy Ivy scene with Manuel and John Paul, the Pope. What for Ivy makes it possible to trust another performer and ultimately to lean into these kinds of intense scenes? How do you communicate with your scene partner or director in order to develop that trust and connection in such a short time? Or is it only something that builds up over time and multiple scenes? Um, I mean, there's like a few ways to answer that. I think that, um, with both Manuel and John Paul the Pope, they had reputations for being really incredible with their scene partners. So having known that and having had heard firsthand experiences from so many other performers, um, I already kind of had a little bit of trust um, with those particular performers and um, also just kind of having those conversations before the scenes, like this is as far as I'm willing to go. These are my boundaries, but you know, up until that boundary, please like go off, do whatever you want to me as long as it's within my boundaries. And both of those performers, both Manuel and John Paul are really incredible at taking you to the edge, but not over it. And that's what I live for. So though I have great chemistry with both of them. So you probably see a lot of that in the scenes. And uh, obviously with time, every scene that I've done with Manuel has gotten better because there is a level of like even more established trust and then a level of kind of like a comfort. Like I, I know this person now, I know how they're going to fuck me and I know, you know, their body and what they're going to do to mine. Um, but I'm also a natural sub. So I, I really love those styles of, of scenes. I love, I love getting my ass handed to me. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Ivy. It was such a pleasure being able to talk to you. I really appreciate you coming on. Can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media and all the websites that you want to plug? Um, you can find me on Twitter. It's my name, Ivy LaBelle, followed by XXX. And then on Instagram, I'm It's Ivy LaBelle. And those are my only social media platforms. So anything else is fake. And then if you want to check out my OnlyFans, it's OnlyFans.com slash It's Ivy LaBelle. And I uh, DM there. I do custom videos and all the new content I've been creating during the pandemic is on there. So check it out. And uh, yeah, that's it. Fantastic. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Twitter and on Instagram. If you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall and filtered. And if you're listening to the audio version of this podcast, go to youtube.com slash Holly Randall and filtered to watch the video version. Thank you guys so much for joining us and we'll see you next week. <laughs>